Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be someone else? To actually see the world through their eyes? That is why we created the documentary series, A Walk in My Shoes. And now we present our latest installment, Military Life. Because great teaching starts with good listening, we went straight to subject matter experts, military members and their families at Fort Riley and Fort Leavenworth, and ask what they wish teachers knew about their lives. Stories highlight the dedication, the bonds, the service, and the challenges our military and their families face. It is our hope that by sharing their experiences, we can provide invaluable insights for our pre-service teachers, learn from each other, and recognize the good that each student brings to our campus, and, in a way, walk in someone else's shoes. That sense of serving something greater and being a part of something large that everybody has an equal share in, that camaraderie and that friendship is something that you just can't really describe or put words to, but a military person kind of understands it. And that's why you form such a strong bond with your brothers in arms. You have to get through it together and uh, you work for that one common goal, you know, just getting home alive. This is all I've ever known is the military life. Very patriotic family. We believe in our country and giving back. Growing up as a military kid, I'm glad that I'll have that background. That way, I'll be able to relate to the students and know exactly how they feel because I know a lot of times you're looking at a teacher and you say, well, you don't understand. One of the things that I want my children's teachers to know is that we do have a very unique lifestyle. It's not bad, it's just different, um, very different. And unless you've been a part of it, it's hard to understand some of those challenges. I think the best part of military life for me as a spouse and a parent has been the opportunity for constant growing and changing myself. I was very surprised to find out the number of our students who are impacted by the military. I didn't understand the sacrifices that those children make along with mom and dad and their siblings and their entire family. One thing I wish that some teachers would be is, is maybe a little more empathetic. When you're in the United States, it's not as easy to understand the difficulties of a parent being deployed. My name is Lacey Sell. I am the superintendent of schools for USD 473 in Chapman, Kansas. I am originally from Abilene, Kansas, and I taught for a few years in Kansas before I went to Missouri and was an educator and administrator in Missouri for 14 years before coming back to USD 473. We have approximately 1,100 students. And of those, around 40% are affiliated with the military. So we have a very large population of our student body that daily is impacted by the military. My first impression of the number of military students in our school district was quite shocking. And I say that because I grew up down the road and I passed Fort Riley as a child on I-70 going back and forth and back and forth, but never once did I stop to consider that students within that area might go to USD 473 or go to a different school district outside of where they were. I was very surprised to find out the number of our students who are impacted by the military. I didn't understand the sacrifices that those children make along with mom and dad and their siblings and their entire family, but I quickly learned that I am responsible for identifying our military children. Some of the challenges that our teachers face in teaching large classes with military children is the transition time. 
That is not a choice that is up to the child and, and they move as the family does. And we know that when a military child moves into our district, that first and foremost, we wanna welcome them with open arms, but we wanna find out where they've been, what are their experiences. And it opens the door for conversation within the class. It welcomes the child in being able to share that my dad is in the military and he's deployed at this time, or maybe vice versa, maybe it's the mom. But, but we try to find out all we can of the child's experiences. You know, we'd like to think that they're ours forever, but we do understand the transition and the resiliency of these children is just phenomenal. Prior to my arrival, there were recognition and thanks given for our service men and women, but not to the extent where we were honoring them in the school. And so we choose to do that through um, classroom visits by any mom, dad, grandparent, maybe a veteran. Um, in each of our schools, we have showcases that specifically show the students and their parents. We um, invite moms and dads, rather it's during the deployment or when they come home and to share about the experiences. And we've, we've broken the barrier of, of it being a touchy subject for the children and their family. We want all of our students to know the importance of the sacrifices that these children go through themselves. It's just not mom and it's just not dad or the caregiver still at home while the other is deployed. It's, it's very, stressful on the children and, and we recognize that we need to work with them and their families and, and we choose to do that. This past Valentine's Day I was invited to one of the schools because we were going to be having our Valentine's Day party but there was a special party planned in one classroom and mom had coordinated with the building principal and the staff that dad was coming home. I went out to the school and I personally got to witness a time when the family was reunited and, and the kids were absolutely shocked. The little boy even commented, you weren't supposed to be home until Saturday. And the dad, boy, that, that really got a good chuckle. There was not a dry eye in the room. I've seen those on the news and shows, but to be able to witness, that was just, it's a memory that I will never ever forget. My name is Daniel Patusik, D-A-N-I-E-L-P-O-T-U-C-E-K. Military life is similar to civilian life and the idea that you work for the better of the community, community being your brothers in arms or if you're a civilian, your neighbors, your, your town. As far as how they're different, I would say how close the community is. Certainly in America, we're more standoffish. As a, a community, a, a town, we can't kind of keep to ourselves. But in the military, you're so close together. You spend so much time together. You, you form a bond and it never really goes away. It's, it stays with you for the rest of your life. I had a, uh, an uncle that served in the Gulf War, uh, Desert Storm, and I also have an uncle who is a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, and my brother does funerals in Arizona for the National Guard, and my sister is in the Air Force, she's a staff sergeant. What's funny is I was actually uh, the first one to go to war. My brother's a year older than me, and I never really thought how they felt while I was over there. Until I got back, I actually got out of the army. My brother had joined and uh, he deployed to Iraq. And I got that experience and uh, I, it changes you, definitely. The worry, the anxiety, and especially since I knew what, what happens on a day-to-day -day basis overseas in Iraq. I uh, explain it to people this way. 
When I was in high school, all I wanted to do was serve my country and go to war and do my part. But once I got a taste of it, I realized that there's quite a bit of pain and uh, blood, sweat, and tears involved, and uh, it's not fun at all. And that's why you form such a strong bond with your uh, brothers in arms. You have to get through it together, and uh, you work for that one common goal, you know, just getting home alive. I was diagnosed with PTSD. I never really noticed that I had it until about two years ago. And uh, when I was in, uh, you were considered uh, weaker or, or not up to the task to defend your country. And people say flashbacks and they think that it's, it's like 15 minutes of you thinking you're someplace else, but that's not really what it is. It, it's almost like a split second or you're walking and you smell something and it reminds you and then you get the feeling of that moment when something terrible happened to you or your friend or uh, someone in front of you. And that those feelings just rush through your body and your, and uh, it's just a recurring nightmare that uh, doesn't go away. And, you know, I, I try to think positive and, and I did serve my country and I, I did well and try and honor um, my comrades that, that perished over there. When people think of a soldier, they think of uh, maybe an Iron Man or a robot, something that John Wayne or Clint Eastwood. But we're human and uh, we struggle with emotions uh, every day, and especially when you're overseas. A way that teachers can be more empathetic is to maybe have someone come in, a, a veteran, and, and explain it's not Call of Duty Modern Warfare. My personal perspective uh, from being in war that I, I would share with my students is the culture of Iraq. I would also share the personal experiences that I had that were positive and try not to focus on the, all the negatives or the politics. Just the story of human interaction. My name is Kim Schaffner. I was born in Lander, Wyoming. I moved to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas three years ago. It is one of many, many moves I've made over the years. I have been married to my husband for almost 20 years. We have two children. Our daughter is 16 and a sophomore in high school, and our son is 12 and in sixth grade. My dad was in the Air Force. He was from Wyoming, so we moved multiple times while I was growing up. This is all I've ever known was the military life. Very patriotic family. We believe in our country and giving back. My mom worked as a nurse. So we never lived on a military base. We always lived in the community. So I was not going, I never went to school with military kids. Because of that, whenever we moved, my sister and I would go to a new school and there were no other military children. It was always just the two of us. So it was hard for teachers to understand what it was like to move as many times and constantly transition in and out of um, classrooms. We joke now, I was best friends with my sister for the first couple of weeks or months until I could find my own friends again. Trying to, to fit in um, and become part of that group was very hard. Years ago, when I was growing up, teachers didn't understand. Uh, and because I wasn't in that military community, they weren't used to it. So I was going to school with kids who started um, school together from kindergarten and literally graduated together, you know, 12 years later. And I, you know, I went to five schools in fifth grade. So it was, it was a constant challenge. When we moved from California to Miami, Florida, 
um, I had a very hard transition, extremely hard. I was in the middle, middle school I think is hard anyway, but when you take a middle school teen, you know, preteen girl and move her from different cultures, I was in shock. I planned for an entire year to move back to California. I saved money, I had schemed with one of my friends, I was going to go live with her, which is very common if you, you know, if you talk to some of the experts. I was very much in de denial and in the resistance stage of that transition cycle. I think that's probably the only time my, my parents wished that maybe this wasn't the best move for, maybe we shouldn't have done this. Um, I look back and say, no, you know, I needed to grow up and it forced me to grow up a little bit. And the lessons that I learned were invaluable. I think that every move that we made, my parents did it as an adventure. I was able to explore different cultures, different states, different countries that many of my friends only read about in books. I guess it would go back to everything was about attitude, and they looked at it very, it was a very positive thing for us, a great benefit that they could give to us that um, many others weren't fortunate enough to experience. And because of that, I think I've actually have passed that on, I hope, to my children, you know, when they've moved. So I think attitude is a big part of it. I think teachers are more aware of military kids in some locations. I don't think that it's everywhere, and I think with the job that I do, talking with the teachers, I'm still very surprised at some of our um, school districts that have military schools within their venue and their footprint who have been teaching military kids for 30 years that they're not aware of the basic elements, the fact that our children move six to nine times before they graduate. I work for a company called uh, Military Child Education Coalition. It's a nonprofit that advocates for military children with respect to their education. One of the initiatives that falls under MSEC's umbrella is their parent-to-parent -parent program. I have been a trainer for them and am now currently a supervisor. And what the teams do, we will go and give workshops to parents on how to help their children um, not just survive but thrive in the military lifestyle, especially with respect to their education. So when they get ready to move, when they get settled on the other end, how to best um, talk to the gaining school so that they're placed properly. It takes up to three months for children to kind of adjust and get settled into that new school. And it's not just from the student's point of view. A lot of times it's from the school understanding what records mean from a different state. So if we can give that information to the parents ahead of time and help them to help the school, it'll make a difference. Hi, my name is JR. I live in Wamego, Kansas, and I'm here at Kansas State University for some of my degree in biology education. I was raised a Kansas kid. We had no connection with the military. And uh, my wife and I met here in Manhattan. She was much closer to graduating than I was, and so she looked at me and said, one of us needs a job. And we decided, or I decided, that hey, the military might be a good option. We talked, I joined, and 26 years later, we returned right back here to Kansas State University. When I first joined the military, I asked to uh, be stationed at Fort Riley because my wife was uh, finishing her degree, and I was given that. We got to stay here at Fort Riley for 18 months, and then they shipped us to Germany. I'd never been anything anywhere outside of the, of the state except for basic training when I went to Oklahoma, and then all of a sudden, myself and my wife she just was thrilled. She's going. To, we're going to Germany. She loved it. I'm terrified. I hadn't been out of the state of Kansas, and I'm like, no, this isn't going to be fun. Well, it was my job to find all the necessary lodgings and, and whatever it was just to get them over to, so they could come over. So that was tough. I'm in a new country, in a new job, in a new place, without my wife, who has been there, and uh, it was quite the challenge. What I found out, there were guys who had already done that before. And that is where the military culture really took over. I got given a sponsor, is what, it, what we call it, a, an experienced individual who has already done it, about the same age as you, but he's already done, so he knows what to look for when you're looking for an apartment or you're looking for 
for housing for your family. So this sponsor helps bring you into the unit, bring you in and calm you down and say, okay, let's go look here. This is a great place. I know he already knows the, he already knew the, the area. He already knew the, the surrounding uh, villages. And uh, that was where my first truly, I mean, immersed experience with the army culture and how we take care of our own. The military culture is different, but you know, uh, anybody will tell you that if you learn to do what you're supposed to be doing, when you're supposed to be doing it, at the location you're supposed to be doing it at, in the right uniform, you're never wrong. Never ever wrong. And once you learn that, and that's the basic training with the drill sergeants, that's where you learn it. But once you learn that that's all I got to do is be where I'm supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing, it turns out to be a great way of life. To this day, soldiers of mine, soldiers that I've run into or I've led or I've served with, will contact my wife via Facebook, say, how's he doing, what's he doing, what's he look like, what's he up to, how's retirement? So that camaraderie, that, that sense of serving something greater and being a part of something large that everybody has an equal share in, that camaraderie and that, that friendship, that is something that you just can't really describe or put words to, but a military person kind of understands it. In 1980, when I came here for the very first time as a freshman, I was a secondary education biology and speech and theater major. I spent two years, the appropriate term would be enrolled at K-State before my wife says, we need a, <laughs> you need a job. Well, so I've always had the interest in being a teacher. Well, I started this goal in 1980. I started this, this path. Now, 26 years of globe hopping and seeing other things resulted in me landing right back where I started. And I wanted to finish something that I started so many years ago. One thing I enjoy about being back at K-State in the age that I am is, you know, we always say that youth, oh, youth, it's wasted on the young. I get to relive it. I get to go back to school. And how many times have we said, oh, if I only knew what I know now, if I'd have known it then. Well, I do. I get to do those things. I know now what I should have known then, and I'm getting to do it again. So interacting with professors, wonderful. Tremendous experience. Respect for them is is immeasurable. I, I, I love every one of the professors I've ever had a class from because I've been treated very respectfully back. I take my time at K-State as my job. Grades are my pay. So if I don't get 100% of my pay, then I rip myself off. And I take that, that uh, attitude with me into the classroom. I paid for 100% of this class, I want to get 100% of this class. And I work because that's my pay. As a military child, you don't get a choice. Like my mom, she had the choice of becoming a military spouse, but you're just kind of thrown into it. And it's not something that I would ever trade either, because I got to see some really cool places. I've lived in seven different towns, and I've seen so many different places. With the awesome things, there also comes hard times, like when your dad is deployed and your brother has a hard time with that and he's having emotional turmoil and he's throwing fits and acting out and he doesn't usually do that. And then as his older sister, you have to cope with that and say, okay, well, he's not usually like that. A lot of times when I meet somebody, they don't even realize what army life is even like. I've had people who don't even realize what a fort is, you know, like Fort Riley. They, they asked me if my dad sleeps in a tent all the time. They don't understand, you know, that we live that. in houses. Um, 
it's just a normal life, but your dad doesn't go on a business trip. He goes to war, he goes to Afghanistan. Um, so when I'm explaining it, it is really difficult because some of the things I don't understand. And then it's also hard for them to understand the pain that I'm going through as well as my family. I mean, they get excited for me when my, my dad comes home, but they don't really understand how long we've been waiting for this because their dad doesn't go away for a year to this scary, scary place, you know, where he could, he could die at any moment. So you just, it's just hard to explain. I think military families have very similar situations as everybody. Lindsay and I have talked about this, and we were trying to think, well, what is really different? And the only thing that we could really think about was that during wartime, where the other typical American family might sit around and think about the war, we actually really worry about it because our loved one is there. One thing that sticks out in particular, I think when we were stationed in Colorado, he was deployed twice. And we had two of our close friends lose their husbands. And um, both my older girls, their friends with those families, children. And it was very difficult um, to see that. They, their families lived in our neighborhood. It was a circle neighborhood. And one was across the street and one was cat corner. And um, that was a very difficult process to deal with emotionally. On the heels of both of those deaths, Jason, my husband, came home about a week or two later from each of his deployments. And um, then there's guilt that you feel that your own soldier's coming back. But what we did is we created, we wrote a book. And um, we took pictures and we wrote a book about what it's like to be a military kid. And we talked about what life is like when daddy's away and um, things we do. And you know he's gone for all of our birthdays and all the holidays. But you know I write him, and I do packages, and I'm hoping that while he's gone, nothing happens to him like such and such as dad. And um, and it was kind of neat because the pictures in the book were of Lindsay and her her sister Haley, and the other two were little little. So those pictures, um, it was neat for them to see themselves in the, that book. Hi, my name is Sandy Risberg, and I am an instructor here at the Kansas State University College of Education. I am the coordinator of the Military Connected Student Education Program. It is an organization that is designed to educate both our pre-service and our in-service teachers on the culture of the military child and the best ways to meet their unique needs in the classroom. I was born and raised in Clearwater, Florida, and Unlike being a military family member, the house I was brought home to when I was born was the house I moved out of when I got married. And so I had uh, no experience with the, the constant moving and uh, the situations that, that, that causes with families and spouses and household goods and children and school and education. You know, raising kids in the military is an interesting journey because of all the transitions and the deployments and all of the moving we've done. Uh, our family has moved 11 times and my children have attended seven different schools each. It's interesting, when I've talked to my boys about what the military lifestyle has done to them or for them, <laughs> they have actually said, you know, they've gotten to see things and do things that other kids don't get to see and do. And it's given them opportunities to meet new people, to try new things, to remake themselves when they start in a new school. When my older boy was filling out some scholarships, one of the questions was, how has being a military child impeded you as a student and your academics. And he came to me and he said, this is a silly question, it, it hasn't impeded me in any way. And I said, well, when you were a junior in high school, 
You were selected at the end of the football season to be the captain for the football team for the rest of the year and for your senior year. Did that happen? Well, no, we moved. Both my boys had to move their senior years. So he went from being what would have been the captain to standing on the sidelines on a very large football team in another state. And I said, well, what about student government jobs? And no, I never got elected. The kids didn't know me long enough to elect me. You know, things like that, that um, opportunities um, were just different because of the, the constant moving. One of the many issues that military families deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is the long work hours. Often um, it is not in the control of the parents. They can't just call in sick. Sometimes it depends on the, the mission and the job of the service member. So the non-military parent is often um, doing some single parenting, so to speak, even when the soldiers are not deployed. Some other factors I think that affect military families are the deployments and the length of the deployments. The long conflict our country's been in the last 11 years, we have had deployments that range from nine months to 15 months. Right now, they're back down to nine months, which is much, much better for the families. The 15-month deployments they found had a lot of second-order effects on the health and the well-being, not only of the service members, but also of the family members. I think the best part of military life for me as a spouse and a parent has been the opportunity for um, constant growing and changing myself. Everywhere I go, every place we go, it kind of has become the joke in the family that I never want to go and I never want to leave once I get there. And so I, I make myself very quickly um, find a niche and, and make myself useful in some way, purposeful, in something usually has to do with education. Sometimes it's, it's elementary students, it's been high school students, middle school students, adult family members of the military, and now here, in addition to the adult family members training I do, I also am here in the university training uh, future educators who will be working with military children since they are in every school district in the United States. The College of Education and Dean Mercer decided to be part of Operation Educate the Educator. In 2011, the First Lady and Dr. Biden, under their program Joining Forces, said, we need to help our military children in, in their education, and what can we do about that? And a couple of primary organizations came together, the AACTE and the Military Child Education Coalition joined forces, and they came up with a set of guiding principles that College of Education programs can use to train teachers. And so they were looking for universities to become part of the beginning of this new program. So we're training our staff, we're faculty, and we're training our students who are here, and I've had the opportunity to do that in um, Gary County Schools, up in the Chapman School District, and here in Manhattan, um, and do some training with our teachers in the classroom, and, and not just give them information, but gain from them as well. We're asking those teachers who've been in the field for their insights and their best practices as well. So we're learning from each other and we're, we're hoping to put together something that we'll be able to share with other teacher preparation programs in other universities to better the teaching field across the country. The role that the classroom teacher can play in helping military students is to be understanding, to be aware of the, the cultural lifestyle of the military child, to maintain structured classrooms and high expectations. Nobody's asking teachers to lower expectations for military children. Um, matter of fact, it's the other way around. Conversation needs to occur in the classroom and in our schools. I think back in the day, it used to be that you would tiptoe around the child who's mom was in the service or whose dad or maybe was deployed that maybe we don't bring that up or we don't talk about that but we need to have communication and we need to have honesty and we need to talk with these kids 
my one piece of advice would be take the time to work with your building principal and your counselor to determine who those military children are in your classroom. And then you talk to them, talk to them, talk to them. The advice that I would give teachers that work with students that are in a military family is to be extremely supportive. Say if their father came home from deployment and they missed two weeks, you definitely have to be flexible with their schedule and not be so concerned with yours and really take into perspective how much emotion is, is going through that, uh, that student's mind. I think all teachers should recognize that the deployment process isn't just one year or just nine months. It's a whole long process. The best advice I can give to teachers who will be teaching military children is get to know, uh, get to know your students, get to know their family life a little bit. I would take a tour of the military installation, um, learn some of the resources that are available because you, you may have an issue that, that surfaces, that there's already an organization out there that can help and you can't redirect them if you don't know it's available. If I could give one piece of advice to my kids' teachers of yesterday, it would be to have that empathy because if you've never experienced it, what it feels like to make friends, your best friend forever, and oh, by the way, she or he is leaving tomorrow and they're going thousands of miles away. Before Facebook, before Twitter, before the internet, this was very difficult for children.